audience tonight. I hope they've come hungry. No. <laughs> I like to think of this as like, oh good, we get to do some housekeeping, you know, some house cleaning, some spring, spring cleaning into summer, you know, if you're feeling stagnant or blocked or working with something or even just kind of a general malaise, this practice is really helpful for kind of getting the chi moving and meeting any parts of yourself that have been like, knock, knock, time to talk to me. So here we are. It's a pretty, um, you know, far out title, Feeding Your Demons. How many people are here for the first time? Maybe like raise your virtual, your real hand. Great. Okay, good. Yeah, it's great to have new people. Thank you. I'm glad you're coming. A lot of people are repeats because we do this about once a month, once every four to six weeks. And so if you enjoy it, we'll have more opportunities to continue as well. And um, we will provide, I think Catherine's already done this, provide you with a bit.ly link to two uh, PDFs for you to use with home practice. If this is something you would like to, to do on your own or to at least read about and um, explore on your own. I've provided a solo uh, guided script, something that you can read and take yourself through. Uh, and then also a form that you could print out as a journaling guide. So those are two resources for you to use for yourself, for your own practice. And I believe they're in the chat. Yeah, she's posting the links there. So let's take a moment and take some deep abdominal breaths and take a, a little breather here. Take a moment to land and arrive more fully in your body with your breath. Allow the eyes to close so you can turn your awareness inward and feel that inner space softening and opening. Notice if there's any holding. Sometimes the base of the skull is tense, the jaw, the neck, the shoulders. Just breathe in and then release with the exhalation, letting go, feeling that there's more space space growing between the sutures of the skull, between the jaw, joint, <clears throat> shoulder blades softening down the back, the low back, the hips, the feet, everything just nice and relaxed. <clears throat> Feel yourself connected to the earth, Mother Earth, her support, and ask her to take any load that you've been carrying. Just feel it as if you've been carrying any, if you feel that you've been carrying any weight, shoulders, on your body in some way, just put it down. Ask the earth to hold it for some time now so that you can do your inner work, your nourishment, your replenishing. I like to touch my thighs or touch the earth or the cushion just to make that contact. Putting it down. And also acknowledging that the earth that we are standing or seated on has uh, been inhabited by others, indigenous cultures throughout many, many hundreds of years. And we acknowledge that we are on that ground. I acknowledge I'm on a lonely land here in Berkeley. Can I acknowledge wherever you are, the ancestors of the earth. And that you are here now to do your own work so that you may be of benefit, a good ancestor as well. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> yeah, here we are on a deeper level now. I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about Machi Glabrin's teachings on what are demons before we go into the practice. 
course, we can understand in our vernacular sense that demons aren't goblins or ghouls, vampires or ghosts out there. They're, you know, we talk about this in our vernacular culture, like we are struggling with my demons, the shadow, <clears throat> these aspects of our psyche, of, our, of ourselves that um, hasn't come home yet, that haven't come home yet, that are maybe disenfranchised <clears throat> without a home. And so through this practice, like in all other meditation practices, for the most part, we're inviting those pieces of ourselves home so that we can become a more fully integrated and activated bodhisattva, someone who is access, has their own access, access to their own power and potential and love and compassion so that then we can be a place of refuge for others. And so feeding your demons falls within that category of that kind of coming home and integrating. But also we can understand demons in terms of this kind of older tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, of Buddhism that came from India, in fact. The discussion of demons uh, or Mara is the original word for the so-called devils or Mara the hindrances. And the Buddha met Mara. If you know the life story of the Buddha, you will have heard that along his path, he met Mara in many different guises as uh, someone trying to tempt him off of his path. Oh, you don't deserve to do that. You'd rather be a, a king. You don't want to be an ascetic. You don't want to give up your privilege, you know, and wander around. And he saw Mara. He said, Mara, I see you in that moment. I see you, Mara. And in that moment of seeing and recognizing that, that energy for what it was, it said that Mara just evaporated. So my question to you is, can you see Mara when it or they or arrive in your life? Can we say, I see you, Mara. I know who you are, rather than believing and reifying it. So that's what meditation also helps us to do. Of course, Mara also appeared later, right on the eve of the Buddha's enlightenment with armies and with temptress dancers and <laughs> you know, all sorts of different um, attempts to pull Buddha off of his seat. But Buddha said, I see you. I know you for what you are. You're not real. You're an expression of my own fear, my own doubt. And it's like a cloud in the sky. It arises and passes away without any solidity. And yet there are some times when these Maras feel very real, right? Like, uh, Maybe real but not true. A wonderful teaching from Sohni Rinpoche that we're reading in the book, in our book study right now. He talks about emotions, anxiety, fear, anger. It feels real, but on a deeper level, does it really have intrinsic truth to it? Is there really a solid thing there called my demon or my fear? And so when the 11th century Yogini Machig Labdran from Tibet was a nun studying in nunnery in Tibet at a young age. She studied the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the Mahayana Sutras. And in there, there's a lot of teachings on the Maras and what they represent and that they are not real things, but they're expressions of our own mind. And she had an epiphany when she read that. And that is really one of the first moments that, that tripped her into a deeper, authentic knowing of the practice and the path for herself, not just memorizing mere words. So Machig Labdran uh, was born in 10, I think it's 55 CE. And she lived for about 99 years and was the, the most, if not one of the most, really the most prominent, apart from Yeshe Tsogyo, uh, Machi Glavdran was really the most prominent uh, female teacher in Tibet. And she established her own lineage and that was very uncommon. Even Indians from India heard about her teachings and came to threaten her and debate her and she won the debate. So she really, she really validated her own teachings. Her story is fabulous, and you can read her biography. There are a few different texts. You can read about her in uh, Tsultra Malioni's book called Women of Wisdom. There's a wonderful translation of her biography in that book. 
but Machig Ladrin developed her own understanding of demons. And right before her death, her son, who was also her student, asked her, Mom, what are demons? <laughs> you know, from your perspective, what are demons? And uh, she said, demons are that which block your experience of freedom. Anything that blocks your experience of true freedom. And then she also earlier had taught on her own kind of system, systematic cate categories of the four, four demons. In the sutras, there's kind of a more traditional or earlier interpretation of the four demons taught by the Buddha. But she integrated and innovated it. And so I wanted to share her teachings as a framework for us to, to um, rest in before we do our practice. And I'll guide you through the practice so you don't really have to remember any of this, just feel it, feel it, and then you'll be guided through the five-step process of feeding your demons in a moment. So the first of Machi Glabrin's four demons is the outer demons. And outer demons are that which come in through the senses. So phenomena, stimuli, people, <laughs> your partner, <laughs> you know, life, work. So these, these things that come in from through the senses of the five, you know, the five senses, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, touch. And so those can be initial stimuli that cause blockages and challenges. But then there's also the next level called the inner demons. And the inner demons uh, are also called the demons that run on and on. What do you think runs on and on in the inner world? The mind, yes, thoughts. So based on, you know, perhaps experiences we've had in our youth, children, family, challenges, trauma, experiences, loss, whatever it might be, that's external. Those are outer so-called circumstances or demons in this context coming in. But then if we, you know, those outer stimuli can create inner thought patterns that repeat in that loop. And so those are the inner demons, our hopes, our fears, our anxieties, our broken heart, our distress, our resistance, our anger, our sadness. Those are the inner demons. And those are primarily what we work with in the five steps of feeding your demons, right? So like if you feel that you're having a challenge with a partner or a work colleague or someone out there or circumstances, an organization or a boss, they're not actually the real demon. What we work with in the five steps is our reaction to those outer circumstances. So if you're working with your parent, like your mother, mother demon, when you do the process, you're not like imagining her there as your outer demon. The first step is to always feel it in your body. Where is my anger at my mother living in my body? And then that's what takes form as an energy being that we dialogue with and then feed and then yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll experience it. So don't reify the problems as people out there. So that's the second. So first one is outer demons that come in through the senses. Second is the inner demons that run on and on. And then the third are called demons of elation. Demons of elation, which is kind of a, oh, I don't love the translation. It's, it's the demons of clinging to, um, Yes, it's egoic, but the fourth one is more about the, the core wound, which is the ego clinging. So this second one is more, this third one is more of like the clinging to pleasure, clinging to status, clinging to wealth. Those, the, that kind of, it's okay to hope and want better, but when it obstructs your experience of freedom, we have to be careful with that striving or that goal-oriented way of being in our life. So keep an eye on that. You know, how is my ambition? Where does it get out of balance? And when it's out of balance, then check yourself. Where does craving the ultimate life partner actually get in the way 
of you experiencing authentic relationship in the moment. You see, that's a demon evolution too. Is that making sense? Can I get some nods? Yeah, okay. Also, there can be a demon evolution within our spiritual practice. So, how many people have experienced deep states of consciousness, bliss even, when you're meditating or on the spiritual path? You're like better than any drug, right? You know, like, whoa, this is amazing. This is what I've always wanted. <laughs> then the mind clings at it. It doesn't always have to, but it's quite common. And in, in, on the path, the Buddhist path, especially in Vajrayana, they say bliss, bliss can be the greatest obstacle. Some of us haven't had that yet. You're like, wait, I want some bliss, you know? <laughs> But just you wait and see you, you get the bliss and then the next day you're like where's the bliss you know i want that again and then you don't get it because you're wanting you're not in the moment you're not yeah you're 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 uh, kind of pining over what was and that's this form of suffering but also this demon of elation can come up in spiritual practice because the ego can say wow i'm really good now i'm i'm i am a buddha <laughs> you know? I have really realized, aren't I special? Oh, I get this title. I've been acknowledged by my teacher. They smiled at me. They gave me a pat on the back. Then the ego can puff up. So we have to always be aware of, of when the ego wants to come in and assert itself. I'm better than thou, holier than thou. Very big kind of hindrance with the, uh, with the uh, third demon of elation. Then there is the fourth, which is the uh, de demon of ego fixation, this ego clinging. And as the Buddha also taught, this is really the core. So you can see how the outer, inner, then elation, and then the ego clinging gets more and more subtle. So this is really the root of all of the other uh, problems that arise from a Buddhist perspective that we misperceive the nature of our own existence. And because of that mistaken perception, we get lost, we get confused, and then we create all sorts of karmas unknowingly uh, that lead us even farther away from where we want to be. So by with the ego clinging demon, it's that demon of reifying your, your sense of self. Yeah, I'm Chandra and I am, and it's not even just like elation, like I'm so great. It's more of like the, the raw base fixation of, or clinging or assumption that Chandra, I'm reading this myself here, exists independently of anything else. That there's really a solidly existing Chandra in here. I mean, you know, if I were to, crack open my skull, would I see a little mini me in there driving the show? It's no, you see a bunch of gray and white matter. That's not Chandra. Is it my voice? No, that's my, that's the voice that's being created through sound and the tissues coming together in the throat, the breath. Is it my heart beating? No, that's just an organ. It's not Chandra. So the Buddhists do a really great job of breaking it down. Where is Chandra? Where is Catherine, where is Noam? Is it the face? But all these things come together to create the impression of Chandra. But as Thich Nhat Hanh says, these different uh, aspects of ourselves are like the tributaries that come together to create the, the temporary river called the self. So you have those teachings of the five skandhas, the five aggregates, basic dharma teaching uh, form is the first aggregate that makes up who we are, meaning the five elements are made up of earth, water, air, fire, space. And then the second is that of feeling. So because we're in form, we have a body, we feel, we make contact with the world. And based on that contact, the third skanda is Perception, because we feel, we perceive then, good, bad, neutral. We like it, we don't like it. And based on that, then we develop karmic propensities. 
this is interesting, especially in the field of like uh, bias, you know, what are we biased towards or against? That's the fourth, that's this karmic propensity. You could say like our bias, what do we like? What don't we like? What are we neutral towards? Is there a neutral? Is there even a neutral? I'm asking that recently. In terms of racial justice, there's no neutral, right? But is there a neutral in this field? Do we ever really feel neutral? Maybe we need to challenge the Buddha on that one. Is neutral, the feeling of neutral, just an indifference? I don't care. Is it numb? Is numb a neutral feeling? Or is it a feeling that has other qualities? The Buddha said, don't just believe what I say, but test it like a goldsmith will test a nugget of gold. And so that's the fourth and then the fifth of these skandhas, these aggregates that make up this temporary sense of self is consciousness. And because we're in form and we feel and we perceive and we have karmic propensities, then we have consciousness also. We have a brain with a frontal lobe. We have a particular kind of awareness. And that's not even talking about Buddha nature. That's like consciousness with a little c. These are early teachings. So um that are that is kind of a basic shorter shorthand teaching on the empty nature of our sense of self that yes we are here i am chandra i will go to bed in my bed tonight catherine is catherine she will go to bed in her bed tonight like we are different people and yet we are empty of an of a permanent separate intrinsically existing selfhood. This is called shunyata or emptiness, also called anatman, non-self, basic Buddhist teachings. Very important part of actually getting free. It's very liberating when you grok it for real, when it moves out of an intellectual and into the heart experience, because through that becoming no one, we recognize that we are everyone that we are all interconnected, that my liberation is wrapped up in your liberation. So that is the fourth also of the, so the demon of ego fixation is the fourth of Machiglavdran's demons. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's not to say that we shouldn't have a healthy sense of who we are, a healthy sense of self. We need that, the ego needs to be intact. I need to know my boundaries, who I am, who I'm not. And then once that is nice and whole and healed, then there's also this capacity to enjoy being no one. How many people have felt that, that, you, that joy of being no one? Come on, raise your hand if it's true. A little bit, a lot, yeah. At first you think you're, I don't wanna be no one. And then when it happens, you're like, oh my God, this is, this is it. This is beautiful, this is, I'm bigger. I'm so much more than I thought I was. So you're still there, but you're there in a different way. It's not like you go poof and dip in there. Okay, so now with the five steps, I will guide you. We'll do some relaxation breaths. If you haven't already, start thinking about like, what do I want to work with? It can be as mild as like, uh, I'm feeling antsy. I'm sick of this quarantine. <laughs> so antsy could be a demon. I'm ungrounded. I'm agitated. Or it could be as deep as like your core wound. What is that wound you keep looping into and befriending? And you can work with that if you feel that that's the time and space that you want to take with that. Please stay through the whole process. Don't bail. Because if you don't, if you bail, you don't get to experience the full arc of the healing process. You might hit some bumpy road in the middle. But stay, stay with the breath, stay with your felt sense of the experience, stay with my words, stay with my voice. And you will feel a sense of uh, resolution if you can stay and experience that fifth step of resting in awareness after you've met your ally. Because not only do we meet our demons, we get to meet our allies here and learn from our allies. And we recognize that ultimately these are all expressions of ourselves. 
Okay, so uh, before we dive in, are there any burning questions before we jump in about the feeding your demons? I'm only gonna, I'm gonna look at these comments. So I'm only gonna answer things that directly per pertain to the feeding your demons because um, I don't wanna get too sidetracked into the philo philosophical stuff yet. No self, it can be, yeah, I think maybe she could read a book by Thich Nhat Hanh that's very nice and warm and embracing <laughs> around no self. Um, or just she can let it go and maybe her karma is not right for it right now. <laughs> you can keep it to yourself. Um, yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna check my mic and make sure that the sound is good. And it's true, my, my, my interface is not connected. Oh. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm hooking up my mic so that it's a better sound. Um, let me see here. Here it is. Okay, how's that? Does it sound better? Much better. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm glad Crystal was on the call. She's my sound guru. Thanks, Crystal. Dramatically better. Oh, wow. So many plugs and bells and whistles. Yes, good. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? You could tell, well, you could just tell your wife that I'm becoming no one so I can become everyone and that will make me a better husband. <laughs> yes, good. All right. So I believe uh, Catherine has... Uh, given you, yeah, top, are those, um, are they up there? Here they are. Feeding your demons, it's about the fourth thing, the fifth chat in there. But you don't need that now. For now, you can just close your eyes. But what I do want to say is, in terms of the structure, I will guide you through the whole thing. Your eyes should remain closed as much as possible, or at least mostly hooded if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes. Um, I would say don't look straight at the screen, actually do profile and have an empty seat in front of you so that you can switch into that empty seat. Uh, if you're on the floor, you can have an extra cushion or a, another chair. If you don't have a second chair, you could actually just stand up when I tell you to switch positions and you'll face your original seat just standing. That can be nice if you don't like sitting for a long period of time. This takes about 35 minutes, so it's not too long. You can have a journal nearby, a pen or pencil. I'll give you time to journal afterwards, not during, but you'll journal, have a few minutes to journal afterwards. Get a drink of water, make sure you're warm or comfortable. And if you don't know what exactly you want to work on right now, that's okay. I'll give you a few moments after we do our relaxation breaths to drop in on a deeper level and really check in with yourself to feel into what you want to work with tonight. If you're brand new to this practice, even if you're experienced with it, just always come with a fresh, open mind. Not assuming anything, not assuming what it will be like or that it will be this similar as last time. Just come with a very open, um, almost a playful feeling of, let's see what's here today. So now we're settling in and allowing the eyes to close or be slightly hooded. Make sure your notifications are off, your ringers are off, your family knows that you're meditating and they can't barge in on you. Make sure all of that, yeah, make sure now that that is all as well orchestrated as possible. And then closing the eyes and beginning to take some deep breaths. We always begin with what are called the nine relaxation breaths with the body 
the emotions in the mind. So for the first few breaths, breathe into any physical tension you're holding in your body. And hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. And then with the next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension you're holding. Notice where you're holding emotional tension in your body. And hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. And now breathe into any mental tension or worries you're holding. And notice where you hold mental tension in your body. And hooking that tension with the in-breath, release it with the out-breath. And now we'll take a moment to generate our motivation. So bring forth a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of yourself and all beings. Good, so now we'll take a few moments to feel into what you'd like to work with tonight. What's up for you right now? What's been eating at you or draining you? It doesn't have to be some negative thing. Sometimes people think, oh, I have to work with a demon. That's a negative thing. Sometimes it's heartbreak. Sometimes it's a feeling of um, numbness. Even that's a feeling. Maybe just sadness. So it's not like a, it doesn't have to always be so negative. It's just what's eating at you? What's zapping your energy? What is blocking your experience of freedom? Do we feel overwhelmed? despair, fury, anxiety, depression. You can also work with addiction, whether it's to behaviors or substances, that craving that comes with that. Or even physical ailment can be worked with here. Uh, illness, chronic pain. You don't even have to know the why or the how. You can work with just sensation. A demon can be back pain or migraines or cancer.
and be helpful once you land on the demon you'd like to work with to remember a particular time or incident when it came up strongly. And scan your body and locate where you are holding this energy, this blockage, this so-called demon, most strongly in your body, this first step. Feeling it in your body. So drop out of the storyline. It's not about the story here. It's about dropping into the feeling in the body of where this lives most strongly. You can even say it out loud or internally to yourself, like my heart or my jaw. Or so where is it most strongly in your body? And then notice, what is the shape of this feeling in your body? What is the shape? You can even say it out loud or internally as a way to help you track and stay present with the process. And notice, what is the color of this feeling? And what is the texture of the feeling? Is smooth or jagged, sharp or soft? And what is the temperature of the feeling? Hot, cold, warm or neutral? And now for a moment, intensify this feeling for a moment. And now, second step is to allow this feeling, texture, shape, color, temperature, all of that. Allow this feeling to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. You can even make a gesture with the hands to move this energy out of your body for a moment. And then notice what you see. And make sure it's a personified being, so maybe a rock or a tree or a wall appeared. Ask yourself, if an inanimate object appeared, what would it look like if it were personified with a face and limbs, eyes? As we're going to dialogue with it, what would it look like? And what is its size? What is its color?
What is the surface of its body like? Is it fur or feathers or skin or scales? What is the surface or the texture of its body like? And what is its density? Does it have a gender? And what is its character like? What is its emotional state? And notice, what is the look in its eyes? And now notice something about it that you didn't see before. Now you're going to ask this being, this so-called demon, some questions, three questions. I will say the question and you repeat out loud after me, asking the demon these questions. What do you want? What do you really need? How will you feel when you get what you really need? Having asked those questions, now you will switch positions, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible, and become the demon. So you don't get the answer yet. You just ask those questions, and then you switch. Face your original seat. And take a moment now to settle into the demon's body. Feel what it's like to be the demon. Notice how does it feel to be in the demon's body? You can take a gesture if you need to, an expression of your face or a posture that helps you embody the energy of the demon if you feel that you're stuck in your head here. Drop out of the head. Really let yourself become the demon. And then notice, how does your normal self look from the demon's point of view? And 
And now, answering those questions, speaking as the demon, I will say the beginning of each answer, and then you repeat the beginning and complete the answer. You can do this out loud. Speaking as the demon here, what I want is, what I want is, What I really need is, it's the need beneath the want, the deeper need. What I really need is, speaking as the demon answered that question. When I get what I really need, I will feel. When I get what I really need, I will feel. So the answer to this third question is a feeling, not a state or an idea. How will you feel when you get what you really need? Speaking as the demon, not as your normal self, giving this energy voice right now. When I get what I really need, I will feel. And then when you're ready, when you've answered all the questions, now you'll return to your original seat, keeping the eyes closed as much as possible. Stay in your experience. Once you're back in your original seat, in your normal self, settle back into your own body and see the demon opposite you. And now, either feel that you dissolve your normal sense of the body and that becomes a nectar, or you can imagine that you create an infinite supply of nectar. And this nectar has the quality of the feeling the demon would have when it gets what it really needs. So if it was loved, it would be the nectar of love. If it was whole, it would be the nectar of wholeness. And you're feeding that nectar to the demon until complete satisfaction is reached. So either imagine your physical form dissolves into nectar and you offer that, or you just simply stay as you are and offer nectar in whatever way your imagination offers. It could be light, or f water, it could be rain, it could be flowers, ice cream. And let that nectar flow from you to the demon, and the demon takes it in. You are offering the demon what it deeply, deeply, deeply wants to feel. and offer that unlimited supply of nectar until complete satisfaction is reached. This can take some time here, so continue to feed this unending flow of nectar flowing from you to the demon. And 
Notice how the demon takes the nectar in. Does it swim in it? Does it drink it, eat it, absorb it? Notice what happens as the demon receives and consumes this healing nectar. An infinite supply of nectar flows to the demon and nurtures it to complete satisfaction. And notice when the demon is completely satisfied, has it shape-shifted, has it disappeared altogether? If the demon seems insatiable, then for the sake of our group practice now, I invite you to ask it, how would it feel or how would it look if it were completely satisfied? And now is when we invite the ally to appear. Perhaps the demon has already transformed into an ally. Or if no being remains, invite an ally to appear now before you. If you're not quite sure, you can ask, are you my ally? If it says yes, good. You will work with it. If it says no, then thank it and ask it now to create space for you to invite an ally to appear now before you. And notice what you see. If no ally appears, then ask yourself, what would my ally look like if I had one? What would an ally be if it appeared? This subjunctive phrasing can help trip the subconscious into offering you imagery. And notice now, what is the size of the ally? What are its colors? What is the surface of its body like? What is its density? Does it have a gender? What 
what is its character like? What is its emotional state? What is the look in its eyes? And notice something about it that you didn't see before. Now you'll ask the ally some questions. I'll say them one by one out loud and you repeat after me without ask, waiting for the answer. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge do you make to me? And how can I access you? And then when you're ready, switching positions again, becoming the ally. And so taking that empty seat or standing in front of you, facing your original seat, and take a moment to become the ally now. Feel what it's like to be in the ally's body. Feel free to take a gesture, an expression, or a stance, a position that helps you embody the somatic experience of being the ally. Don't hold back here. And notice, how does it feel to be in the ally's body? And how does your normal self look from the ally's point of view? And now speaking as the ally, you'll answer those questions. I'll say the beginning and you can complete in a full Sentence answering as the ally. I will help you by I will protect you by really speaking as the ally.
I pledge I will. And you can access me by And then when you're ready, go ahead and switch back to your original seat for the last time. And take a moment to settle back into your own body and see the ally opposite you. And seeing the ally in front of you, look into its eyes and feel its energy pouring into you. As you feel the energy of the ally coming into your body, it spreads all the way down to the soles of your feet, your fingertips, throughout your whole body. And now imagine that the ally dissolves into light. And notice the color of this light. And feel this light dissolving into you. Integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body. Take note of the feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. And now you, with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve and rest. Rest in open, spacious awareness. Unbound by the confines of this physical form. Just rest. And then now let's slowly come back, feeling your body, the breath in the body, the clothes against your skin, the heartbeat.
And also feel that you still have that integrated energy of the ally within you. That is you. And as you open your eyes slowly, coming back into the space without losing that feeling of the integrated energy of the ally. So now I'd like to invite you to journal, spend some time journaling, and just recalling as much as you can, free flow, writing, what messages, what answers, what guidance did you receive. If you would like, you can click on the tracking form that Katie sent you. It's the second of the two links, and it can be like a, a guide, helping you remember what those five steps were. But you don't need that. If you want to just journal and free write, you can also do that now. Take about five minutes to journal now. Don't edit yourself, just try to remember as much as you can. If you don't remember everything, that's fine. Whenever you're done writing, you can drop into meditation for a few more minutes. If you're done writing, just meditate. We'll write for about three more minutes.
about 30 more seconds or so. And so now we'll start to come back together. You can always do more journaling later. I would love to... Um, you might hear my 11-year-old making noises. But uh, I'd love to invite all of you back. And time for Q&A, for sharing, for que asking questions, or sharing how that was for you. How was it to meet this uh, within you and dialogue with it, become it, feed it, meet the ally, become the ally, rest in awareness, the fifth step. Any questions? Someone already typed in, uh, this has nothing to do with Nagas. There are stories of Nagas being like demons. Nagas can either be benevolent or maleficent and it depends on if they are respected or not, you know. Nagas are serpentine spirits that are said to live in the earth or water or even sky. Dragons are considered to be like Nagas. Snakes, fish, Loch Ness Monster could be the Scottish version of the Naga. <laughs> so there are stories of Nagas uh, challenging practitioners and then if the practitioner makes offerings to the Nagas of the water or the earth or the sky, then uh, if they are propitiated, then the Nagas will become allies. There's a story of Machiglabra meeting Nagas and offering herself with no fear, just saying, devour me. I, I, I'm not, I don't exist. And they saw how deeply realized she was, so they bowed to her and said, we will be your allies. That actually story is the inspiration for Lama Tsultrim to integrate the fourth step of of. 4B in the guided process, which is the meeting the ally. When she first developed this practice, uh, there was no ally step for a little while. Then when she reread that story about Machi Glabdrin meeting these Nagas and they be the Nagas becoming her allies, vowing to protect her teachings and her, uh, Lama Tsultrim decided, you know, this is important to have in the Five Steps of Feeding Your Demons. So I didn't say that explicitly at the beginning, that Feeding Your Demons is a modern process based in Buddhist meditation, integrated with Gestalt therapy of empty chair dialogue therapy, as you just experienced. And it's called Feeding Your Demons. So it's a modern take on the ancient practice taught by Machiglabdran called Chud which means to sever attachment onto the ego and the separate self. So yeah, the Nagas could be demons. Not always, though, of course. Wasn't the Buddha metaphorically protected from the elements by Nagas while under the Bodhi tree? I believe some stories do talk about Nagas at that time as well. Yeah, so that means they were benevolent protecting him from the elements. Like at Taramandala, before we would drilled any well, uh, looking for water, or built any buildings, we would always do a Naga Puja, a Naga ceremony, propitiating, making offerings of smoke and scents and milk and flowers uh, and prayers of auspiciousness to any water or earth or air nagas in the area, you know, asking permission to dig or to build and making offerings for blessings. It's very common in Tibet and India, these types of things, and other parts of the world, of course. Not so common in the United States. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, someone is sharing that it was a wonderful experience. Thank you for guiding me through this. Yeah, how was it for the new people? Were you new, Victoria? 
If not, that's good too. And the people who've done this a lot before, you could, uh, you can always appreciate how fresh it can be, you know, even if you work with the same challenge, like maybe you, maybe you're addicted to cigarettes, you come back again and again, and the demon doesn't look the same all the time, it doesn't feel the same, the ally can be different, even when you're working with the same issue, never assume that the process will be like the prior process, always come with beginner's mind. Okay, good. Yeah, Victoria done it once before. Someone was new, Diane. I've never practiced this before. It was really life-changing and helpful. A thousand million bows for this. Wow, great. Thank you, Diane. I'm so happy to hear that. It was like that for me. That's why I learned how to guide it, because it changed my life. Now I'm glad for you too. And I receive that kind of feedback a lot. This is such an amazing process. We've actually done a couple studies on it now, and the finding is really, really positive for addiction, for craving, for anxiety, depression. We also did a short study on the anxiety and the fear and the feelings coming up around the epidemic and quarantine. So we're crunching that data right now. So. We're having some statistical support for things that many of us already know. I found myself very tired in the beginning, but I felt my ally was even stronger and clearer th this time. I don't feel as tired. Yes, you accessed your deeper resources, and also the whole process is very restful. Oftentimes, you know, when we struggle, it's very tiring. So here we feed, not fight, the so-called demon, and so it can be very restful and you can find yourself tapping into uh, resources that you didn't know were there. Yes, an anonymous person shared, when I saw my demon, I didn't want to be close to it, then I asked it what it needed. My eyes began to water. Yes, feeding the demon and bringing my, uh, bringing my ally created a soft landing, a new path. Good. Yeah, we're rewiring, aren't we? <laughs> we're not pushing it away anymore. It's so tiring. And we often we find these demons are not our enemies. They're actually there for a reason. They have a message, like a message in a bottle, right? They have a message for us. We have to crack it open and learn. Then we become more integrated. Is the process of dealing with trauma, PTS or PTSD, included in this practice? Yes, it can, but usually when there's um, trauma um, that perhaps is, uh, you know, quite strong, um, you would work with a therapist who is certified in this, and they can integrate the Feeding Your Demons process along the arc of your, your healing journey. And I have many colleagues who are psychologists, um, therapists, counselors, social workers who learn this technique and they offer it to people at certain junctures in their healing arc. And so, yes, you would want to work with somebody who's familiar with working with trauma. Now, having said that, if you've worked with it a lot and you know the terrain, there's no reason why you couldn't work on your own or with a buddy with the guided process uh, as well. Okay, a couple more, maybe a sharing. Also called brain spotting, maybe, instead of train spotting. Maybe, yeah. Well, everyone, thank you for coming. I know that there are many other opportunities here at this wonderful virtual San Francisco Dharma Collective now. 
we have things going on uh, almost every day, I think, of the week, right, Katie? And new series coming up as well on Tuesday nights, I'm sure. Workshops this weekend, maybe. I don't know what's happening. If you want to share, people might like to know. Yeah, so she's giving you the link, so you can check that out if you yeah, want. Yeah, and we have, we have Lama Somo on um, right. Friday night. On Saturday, we start a six-week, uh, no, sorry, six-month, one Saturday a month series on meditation maps with George Haas. So George Haas was a student of Shenzhen Yang, and he is also very grounded in psychology and attachment theory. And he's going to be looking at Dharma maps and meditation maps. Um, that's going to be super interesting. Uh, that kicks off on Saturday. And if you register, even if you can't make all six classes, um, you'll get access to a Dropbox link with information um, and recordings of the classes. And then on Saturday night, we have our monthly climate sit. Um, and this month it's going to, the title is The Climate of Now, and we're going to attempt to interface with everything that's happening right now. Um, we're going to have an open mic so people have an opportunity to share um, what's coming up for them in, um, in this current climate. And there will also be some uh, meditation and practice as part of the evening. So there's that and much more coming up. Um, the best way to know what's happening, uh, you know, the upcoming events section of our website is always current, um, but you can also sign up for our newsletter. And when we announce something new, like we have um, a cool thing coming up on Tuesday nights that we haven't quite worked out the details yet, so we're not announcing it yet, but that will go out in the newsletter first. So if you're subscribed to the newsletter, you'll hear things. Um, as soon as they're available to hear. Uh, so sign up for that and hopefully see you at one of these cool things coming up this weekend. Thank you all, thank you, Chandra. Yeah, thank you. And we'll do Feeding Your Demons again in July. So we'll post that date soon. So you can check back on the website for that. We'll do it once a month on average. And I gave my website there if people wanna see what other things I'm doing. And also you could follow me on Instagram at Lopen Chandra. And I tend to post things regularly there now. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Sleep tight. May all your demons become your allies.